Egdrasil shivers, the ash as it stands. The old tree groans and the giant slips free. A lone tree stands at the center of nine worlds, feeding them with life. Contained within it are the secrets of the universe. The secrets which even the gods sacrifice themselves for. The secrets housed within talk of the end of the world. A moment in time where a war of all wars will begin and consume the land. This is not the story of Ragnarok told within the ancient poems of Norse mythology, but the story of a tree that holds the way to the world within tears of the kingdom. This is the story of that tree, why it is more vital to Hyrule than explained within the game, and its overall significance to the timeline. This is the world tree. This is going to be pretty wild, but I have one last theory to share on Tears of the Kingdom, and I actually plan on proving with ancient stories about gods, in-game footage from Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, translations done by Redditor Livy X Bobby X on the new Masterworks book, and the rest of the game series on the whole, as to why one certain location in Tears of the Kingdom is in fact where the gateway to the Sacred Realm lies. But I don't think I can do this on my own. I need help from someone who can hopefully make the wild claims I'm about to make a reality. My good friend and friend of the channel Splattered Colours is here to help with some artwork and some insight into just what this tree really is. Hey! And yes, it did take two of us to come up with a theory about a tree. Seriously. You can tell that Tears of the Kingdom is at the end of its life cycle now. It is relatively clear that this tree, with its roots entwined with miasma, a term that we'll use from here on out on the channel because it fits a lot better and is the term used in the Japanese translation of the game, that this tree is structural. It seems to have grown up many levels below the ground and holds up the platform that Ganondorf rests upon during his ceiling. As you approach the later stages of the game, you float down the chasm that surrounds where Hyrule Castle once sat, prior to the upheaval. And this tree, the roots seem to wrap their way around every wall of the caverns that lead to the end boss of the game. When you reach the bottom of the chasm though, in a location called Gloom's Origin, upon defeating Phantom Ganon for the final time, a doorway opens within the tree, sealed with the miasma that infects the area dramatically. As you look up, you see the tree in all of its glory, branches reaching their way out in the dark, the trunk propping up this entire structure seemingly. It's obvious that this tree is an aesthetic design from the developers, but why a tree? And why here, of all places, right in the middle of the map, seemingly holding up the world? Nintendo have never been shy about cultural and religious references within their games. Actually, quite the opposite. Tears of the Kingdom itself is littered with constant references back to both feng shui and ancient Japanese beliefs. For instance, the secret stones are designed to look like artifacts from the Zhao Mun era in Japanese culture, named Magatama, and previous games like Skyward Sword have based dungeons on ancient Buddhist stories such as the ancient cistern being based on the short story, The Spider's Web. We shift to tax so quickly here because this tree is another cultural reference to stories told in real life. The story of the world tree, from ancient Norse mythology, Yggdrasil. The stories surrounding Yggdrasil have been told a million times in video games. Dragon Quest X and of course the newer God of War games have literally utilised the tree as a storyline tool, but Zelda games do things a little more subtly. They don't show their hand up front so to speak, but they've left more than enough hints to show us the true meaning behind this tree. This is going to take some diving into some old school mythology. Are you ready? Well, oh, before we start breaking down why this tree is so much more significant than any of us realised at the time, and is 100% the world tree's representation in Tears of the Kingdom, we need you to subscribe to both of our channels, and drop a massive like, and then get in the comments and let us know exactly what you think. Do you want to see more collaborations in the future? And do you think that this tree is anything more than just a design choice? Splatter colours? I do believe it's story time. According to Norse mythology, Egdrasil is a tree that sits at the center of the nine worlds. It links together the worlds by the Bifrost, a rainbow bridge that feeds into each of those worlds. Looked after by the frost giants, or Yatna, Egdrasil grew tall and mighty, but housed a deep, dark secret. Something underneath 
In the southern world, a black dragon sits, eating the roots of the world tree that provides life to each and every world. If the dragon should achieve its goals in biting through the roots of the tree, it would signal the war to end all wars, a fierce battle in which the demons of Muspelheim would pour into the world. During this battle, many giants would battle the gods, and in the end, Odin, Thor, Tyr, Freyr, Heimdall, and Loki would lose their lives. From the offset, we can see a ton of similarities between this tree and Yggdrasil. First of all, where it sits within the world of Hyrule. A Hyrule castle, and therefore the site of the upheaval, is located directly in the centre of the map. It's actually located here, according to Masterworks and the awesome translations done by Livy X Bobby X, because it was set to be fortified and would house a town at the bottom of it called Castle Town. But Castle Town got destroyed during the calamity. Yep, this scene here of the Guardians trampling over a small town is the destruction of Castle Town in its entirety. This was meant to be the center base of the lands of Hyrule at least before Malice made its way into the lands and destroyed everything in sight via the Guardians. Ganondorf is therefore sealed at the literal heart of the world, and the tree that bursts up and holds as a platform that Ganondorf was originally sealed on here in the opening scenes of the game could easily be seen as a representation of another tree through history, Yggdrasil. The similarities between Yggdrasil and Hyrule's three-layered design is quite frankly uncanny. Design decisions don't just happen in video games. More often than not, they come from original idea, mythology, or history. Looking at an illustration of the world tree and the breakdown of the Tears of the Kingdom cross section, the inspiration taken from Norse mythology becomes abundantly clear. We can piece together the many layers of Hyrule by starting our sketch at the very bottom. The depths are littered with miasma and huge roots, some even cascading from the edges of the void beyond our reach. When we dive into Hyrule's castle's trench, Link comes face to face with this massive tree that Ganon has made himself oh so cozy in. We can infer, based on the directions the roots grow in the depths, that this tree is the source of the underworld. Before reaching this tree, you are back in the sealing chamber from the beginning of the game, where Raru once sacrificed himself and Zelda fell. This chamber is surrounded by the crust of the earth and what we know as the beautiful land of Hyrule. Protruding from this chamber, the royal castle sits on a giant pillar that has helped preserve the seal on Ganon for these many, many years. And then, of course, we have the gilded heavenly islands, once inhabited by the Zonai, descendants of gods. Certainly feels a bit more than just a coincidence when you look at these two illustrations side by side. But there is a lot more than just location and circumstance that prove what we're trying to say here. When Yggdrasil trembles, Ragnarok is said to be near. Yggdrasil regularly moans and rumbles, but never does it tremble. Not unless the Great War is close, the war to end all wars, so to speak. Ragnarok was the fear of all gods of the realm. It was written within prophecies that this would be the war to end gods, and come the day of Ragnarok, the realms would fall. Immediately you feel that tremble as you and the princess explore the halls of the caverns underneath Hyrule Castle. From the moment that she lays eyes on the Magatama shaped stone that drops when the seal upon the ancient evil is lifted and picks it up, the ground begins to shake. Link steps forward. The royal knight stepping forward to defend his princess as streams of miasma overpower the hero, his sword. The famous blade of evil's bane, blasted by the stream, fractures and then shatters, the tip of the sword grazing the ancient evil's face. From here, the ground truly begins to shake. A castle is lifted skybound, but not just any castle. The castle that signifies hope in the people of Hyrule. The ancient evil is lifted onto a pedestal, as chunks of rock fall from the sky and cracks open in the ground below. Underneath this pedestal though, is an organic life form, 
the only thing to survive the magic that has ripped the world apart so far. This tree, the branches intertwine and provide support for the platforms that house the ancient evil. The trembling below allows this one to grow taller via the use of dark magic and the movement that this tree felt was indeed the signalling of a great war. In multiple Zelda games, we have heard about a great war that consumes the world. It generally is depicted in stories told as a hero and a princess working together alongside a group of heavenly entities to seal the ancient evil inside of the resting place of a heavenly artefact that can grant one wish to the holder. This story has been told many times over. Whether it being the sages sealing Ganondorf away in the Twilight Realm, or whether it be the story of the maidens that help the hero of legend seal away the primordial beast Ganon, the story remains the same no matter what. Evil is prevented by a group of fearless warriors, maidens or sages, and is locked away for time immemorial. However, we got an introduction to a new sealing war event that occurred many years before the calamity within Tears of the Kingdom. This war was near enough what sealed the fate of the world. Raru sacrificed his life for the good of the kingdom, sealing the ancient evil, using his body as a means of holding the dark magic back. As time went on, Raru's body turned to ash, the Sage of Light as it were, left to decompose under the ruins of Hyrule Castle until only one arm clutching the stone that Zelda now comes to inherit gives away and decomposes like the rest of his body, releasing evil upon the world and thus starting a new war. A war between good and evil, a war to end all wars, Tears of the Kingdom's very own Ragnarok, an event that will kill gods and men alike. There is an undeniable link to the stories of Ragnarok and Tears of the Kingdom, and that's only from one story about the world tree, and a comparison back to this tree. But there's more. There's always more. On page 389 of Masterworks, a great war on the surface is described, the beginning of the sealing war within Raru's era, as Hylians went to war with the Gerudo. During this, Raru is said to use diversionary tactics to lure Ganondorf to a location that would benefit both him and the sages. The translations read, the Hyrule army made its preparations and headed to retake Castle Hyrule, which had been stolen by the Demon King Though they succeeded, many soldiers were lost. As a last resort, they chose central Hyrule as the place of the final battle. This great war was indeed the one that seemingly ended the Zonai race. With only Raru and his sister Minoru remaining, Raru used his heart grab and sealed Ganondorf using his own life force. But that meant a sure end for the Zonai. This war was the one that killed the gods, or at least those with the power of gods. Okay. So a tree and a war are both present within these stories, and that could seem relatively circumstantial. The problem is, is that the similarities don't just end there. They only get deeper and deeper until we reach the roots of the world tree, where there lays a creature with terrifying power. Its serpentine scales glisten in the moonlight shining from the hole in the cave above. The Nihog lies, gnawing at the only thing that keeps him from wreaking havoc on the world, the roots of Yggdrasil. When these roots shall fall, Ragnarok will be upon these worlds. It is here that we skip straight to the end of the game, right about here, when we've defeated Ganondorf inside of Gloom's Lair for the third time. In desperation, he enacts a forbidden magic that lays within the secret stone that he stole from his victim, Queen Sonya. Link has beaten him in battle multiple times. The sword is more than just grazing him, it's now ripping him apart, even in his strength and state. So he takes the stone and drops it into his mouth, swallowing it and allows himself to be consumed by the miasma that he exudes. He, like four others before him at the very least, though there could have been up to seven in total, transforms into an obsidian black serpentine creature, a dragon, a needhog, a word which literally translated back from Old Norse comes to mean he who strikes with malice. A final point about needhog is the stories told regarding when Ragnarok actually begins. Generally, Needhog is seen as harmless, but at the start of the end of days, Needhog bursts free from his confinement, bearing all of the corpses of the dead on his wings, where they will fight for him in the final battle. Upon seizing more power, and this scene being the turning point in a need for war within Hyrule, Ganondorf literally uses his own hatred to summon monsters and creatures to the land, including the undead such as Gibdos, an undead mummy creature that can only be hurt by fire or lightning. 
Following this logic, there should also be a counterpart dragon to Ganon Dragon. And sure enough, Princess Zelda herself fits that description nicely, as after she swallows her secret stone in order to restore the Master Sword by bathing it in her light, she is already there, in the sky, circling it and protecting the lands. Now, the reason why I say that there should be a counterpart is because within Norse Mythos, Jorgmander is the very opposite of everything Needhog represents. Jorgmander represents the world, the life within the world and the protection of said life. He is said to live in the sea, encircling the earth, biting his own tail. He creates his very own Ouroboros, a common theme seen within the branding of the game. When his tail is said to separate from his mouth, the earth or Midgard is no longer under his protection and the world can fall into peril as it means Ragnarok is upon the earth. Now, our scaly princess isn't exactly chomping down on her tail like Jormungandr, but she does encircle most of Hyrule, flying around the same loopable path in the sky repeatedly, which is very different to the other three serpents she shares the airspace with, who all interrupt their flying paths by entering into the depths. Zelda only interrupts her infinite loop once the demon dragon frees himself from the tree in the depths. Soaring to aid Link in his time of need, the loop is broken and they are ready to fight Hyrule's Ragnarok together. And this is the very representation of what we're seeing within the game. Jorgmander or Zelda, Needhog or Ganondorf, and this representation of this great battle being the beginning of the end of times for the world as we know it within the Wilds era. This game, whether Nintendo like to admit it or not, feels heavily inspired by Norse stories. And it almost seems irrefutable at this stage in time. But what does it really prove? How does it prove that this location is anything to do with the Sacred Realm? If we are to believe that this tree is the representation of Yggdrasil, then we can use the idea that this location here is a central point within several worlds governed within the Zelda universe. We already know for a fact that we have Lowrule, the Depths, the Dark World and the Sacred Realm as different realms all governed by this tree's, well, governance. The worlds are organised, or at least to some degree organised, into a radial wheel of desirability. A bit like the notion of heaven, hell and earth, but with nine worlds rather than three astral planes. Over here some world will be low rule. Sure it's not desirable, but it's definitely not as bad as something like the dark world, and the depths, well civilizations used to live down here anyway, so this would kind of be more here on the scale. The twilight realm would be right here, right at the bottom considering that it is quite literally a version of the Sacred Realm with no light whatsoever, completely corrupted by dark energy. I mean, the Zelda series certainly isn't shy of adding the occasional alternate world or realm, and there are many more to be considered here. World of the Ocean King, Termina, heck, even the newest release, Echoes of Wisdom, features a brand new realm, the Still World. Yet, all of these locations seem to connect back to Hyrule, much like the Nine Realms connected via the roots of the World Tree. Opposite that, at the top would of course be the Sacred Realm, the equivalent in Norse mythology to Asgard. This tree is directly below where the ceiling site of Ganondorf is, indicating that if the Sacred Realm is above, then potentially the entrance point is where Ganondorf is sealed. And with a little bit of extra lore detail from Masterworks, this may actually be plausible. Sometime after the Zonai begin to die out, the Zonai come back down to the land in order to mingle their abilities amongst normal people. Raru met Sonya, a shrine maiden, or Miko, and fell in love with her. They got married, and Raru shared his power with her via a secret stone which enhances power she never knew that she had over time. Raru and Sonya went on an exorcism pilgrimage, travelling across points on the map where the two would perform a ritual using their magic. They would expel any enemies from the area and then leave behind a small stone, a blessing of light, which locals would go on to build statues of the two around, before erecting statues around those to contain and protect the stones. One of two things happened from here. The shrines either grew roots which reached down to the depths, where they would eventually emit light, or roots that were searching for light to grow, shot upwards from the floor of the depths and into the sky, searching out the shrines. Where this most sacred land potentially lies, a tree did indeed shoot from the floor of the depths, but the light had all but faded once it reached its destination, and the dark magic that had encircled the area for millennia ate away at the roots, ate away at the light left by said tree. This tree is a light root, but it's not just a light root, it symbolises the life of the planet, and at this point in the game, 
the tree is just a withered husk, growing only due to dark magic in the atmosphere. So that's the tree. As explained as any two people can ever explain one singular tree in a video game. But I think there's more to this. I said something along the lines of proving why this room is the sacred realm, or at least the entry point to the sacred realm. And the tree is just one point, one very long point a about a bit of wood. But there's more to this theory than just Norse gods. See there's evidence. Earlier on I started the quote. I read something from page 389 of Masterworks but I only read a portion of the quote. The rest of it is actually more interesting than the bit that I read out earlier. It's supposed. The reason for that is that the area was sacred ground, which was advantageous for Raru and the others. In present, the place where the Demon King had been sealed was called by the name Godly Era Ruins, but it has been identified that it was built more like a temple, and some priests have suggested that it may be the Temple of Light of Legend. They probably chose it as a place of the final battle because of the advantage of some kind of sacred power. The area that Ganondorf is sealed within is considered sacred grounds, and it's given the name of the godly era ruins, and they claim that it could be the Temple of Light of Legend. The, uh, the Temple of Light. We've never really had a Temple of Light formally in the games. However, there was a Temple of Light. It was originally planned for Ocarina of Time, and now it's almost relegated to the legend that surrounds the release of that game. This was due to the fact that each sage had their own respective dungeons. Soraya with the Forest Temple, Darunia, the Fire Temple, Ruto, the Water Temple, Impa, the Shadow Temple, and Naboru, the Spirit Temple. Raru, however, was made the de facto guardian of those sages, so to speak, and just resided within the Sacred Realm. This Sacred Realm was his temple, his place of worship, his place of solitude, his temple, and his element as a sage, none other than light. This area was chosen by Raru because of his ancient power, because it could help in the fight against evil, but once again evil corrupted and worked its way inside. And Ganondorf knew and understood what this location was and why it was important and its relevance to the Zonai in the world, hence why he allowed the fight to happen here. Let's not forget, this incarnation of Ganondorf is cunning and incredibly smart. He appears to be a learned scholar, having learned legends about Draconification that were only seemingly taught amongst the Zonai. He also seems to have somewhat a historic knowledge of the Zonai race, indicating that he knows a lot more than he lets on throughout the game. But also, we can't forget his past. We're well aware, this incarnation of Ganondorf is not the same as this one. Or this one, or even this one. We know this because Gerudo males are born every 100 years. And these games are separated by more than that distance in time. Evidenced by the hero Shade being a decomposed skeleton by the time that the hero of Twilight finds him. But each incarnation wants the same thing, and in pretty much the same way. Like they're stuck in a loop. They want total power, to be a god, to seize control of the Triforce and the Sacred Realm. In Ocarina of Time, Ganondorf aims to obtain the entire Triforce, but gets sealed within the Sacred Realm, either by the Sages and Zelda in the Downfall timeline, or within the Sacred Realm by the Hero and Zelda in the remaining timelines. In A Link to the Past, Ganondorf succeeds with this, gaining the Triforce and turning the Sacred Realm into the Dark World. In Twilight Princess, Ganondorf attempts to drag that darkness, the darkness that he creates within the Sacred Realm which he's now renamed into the Twilight Realm, into Hyrule. In each game, his motivations are not so much to do with ending Link or Zelda, but more so he plans on absolute rule via the Triforce. The Triforce is not really mentioned in Tears of the Kingdom. It does make it harder, admittedly, to tie this to Ganondorf in Tears of the Kingdom, but consider this. Again, we know that Ganondorf is smart and actually insusceptible to provocation. During no scene in the game is he able to be provoked by any character, including during the Sealing War where he is the calmest man in the room against an army of magical animals and rock people. However, Masterworks wants us to believe this. While the Hyrule army evacuated north, the Demon King's army went south. Furthermore, it is thought that while directly launching an attack on the Demon King, they lured him unaccompanied into the innermost sacred ground. Details cannot be known today, but it is assumed that the surviving Hyrule army played a role in this. A point at issue of Raru and the others' plan was if the Demon King would follow this sequence. But perhaps Raru thought that with his immense pride, Ganondorf would follow 
this obvious enticement. In fact, perhaps Ganondorf took Rari's provocation, thinking that he could win despite being in a disadvantageous place. Raru believed that Ganondorf, due to his pride, which yes, is one of his downfalls throughout the series, would rise to provocation. A man that carefully calculated an open murder on the Queen of Hyrule, first laying bait by testing out the powers of the Secret Stones before sending in a dark doppelganger of the princess in an attempt to kill Sonya, and then initiating a double bluff situation where Ganondorf appears from nowhere and successfully commits regicide. In fact, we only need to look at the final human form fight against Demon King Ganondorf, where he perfectly parries almost every move that we do against him. Ganondorf is unflappable. In all but one scene where he begins to lose control to his hatred, where he then goes on to enact Emergency Plan A, where he would swallow his stone. This location was picked, yes, and in lore detail it was picked up by Raru, but we believe that Ganondorf was already acting one step ahead. He already knew that this building somehow some way connected the pathway to the Sacred Realm, right at the heart of the world where Yggdrasil sleeps. If you've enjoyed that look into mythology in Zelda, why not check out this video on why Link is definitely a god. And while you're there, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Every single subscription helps. Thank you so much, Splattered Colors, for both your input and amazing artwork. Thanks for having me. And hey, if you like this design, check out my Etsy, where you can own this illustration and other cool Zelda merch for yourself. Please go check out her channel in the description and the comments below. I'll see you next time.